Okay, we are in Matthew 21. We're going to cover the parables that Jesus gave in Matthew. And parables have a lot of symbolism. And symbolism helps you understand something as spiritual as your heart. And, of course, not human wisdom, but things that are written in spirit combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. And that's what the symbolism is. And we're going to start with a parable of the landowner. And the landowner, listen to this parable, another parable. There was a landowner, and that's God the Father, Creator, who planted a vineyard. And a vineyard is an example of type of church. And put a wall around it. And that is a hedge of protection. That is uh, God's uh, shield of protection. And dug a wine press. Now the wine press is an interesting word in the Old Testament. And it symbolizes pressure, stress, stress of controversial questions. 1 Timothy 6, 14 says that human wisdom brings these people that have controversial, morbid interests. A morbid interest in controversial questions. Controversy questions. Controversial questions. Morbid interest. And the wine press is in the church of controversial questions. And they built a tower, which is a pasture. Pasture of the church. And rented it out to vine growers, which is the staff. The vine growers are the uh, deacons of the church. Uh, the deacons, and went on a journey. Now we're going to go back to the top of the page, and we have verse 34. And when the harvest time appeared, approached, he sent his slaves to the vine grower to receive his produce. And the... Uh, People in the church are, you know, receiving God in the church, congregation. They sent it to the vine growers and the deacons to receive the produce of the fruits of the Spirit. In verse 33, and what are the fruits of the Spirit? They're in Galatians 5, 22. Uh, love, the fruits of the Spirit, love, peace, joy, patience, tolerance, temperance, meekness, so fruits of the Spirit. 35, and the vine growers took his slaves and beat one. Now, the vine growers took his slaves, deacons in the church, picked out somebody with controversial questions, and beated one, and killed another, and stoned another with his words. That's uh, in John... Uh, 1 John 3, 11, you can look up what the word says when you hate somebody or stone somebody, you could be with your words. In, in Psalms uh, 50 through 60, in Psalms 50 through 60, it says that your words can actually kill someone, that your words can actually stone someone, that you can beat someone uh, with your words. 36. Um, Again, he sent another group of slaves, congregation of people, larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. These uh, vine growers, the deacons of the church, uh, started beating them. But verse 37, but afterwards he sent his son Jesus to them, saying, they will respect my son Jesus. The Jesus being the the word. 38. But when the vine growers saw the son, Jesus, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So basically, they did not receive the word of God in that church. Uh, that church had its own uh, doctrine, has its own traditions, it has its own routine. And nothing was going to change the routine of the church. Um, instead, they were going to beat some of the people or uh, have hateful words to say about them, 
pretty much throw them out of the church because they're not lining up with the church's rules, the church's policy, uh, the church's governance. So they weren't accepted. And uh, in the word of God, Jesus was not accepted. In verse 39, they took him and threw him out of the church, the vineyard, and killed him. And you can look up 1 Peter 2, 7 and 8 about that. Um, but that's another way of saying that they hated him. Verse 40, um, Therefore when the owner of the vineyard, that's God the Father, uh, comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And 41, They said to him, He will bring those wretched, wretches to a wretched end. He will rent out that vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds <clears throat> at the proper season. In other words, it's going to be a shakening in that church. And eventually, God the Father is going to replace those vine growers and going to replace the uh, leaders of that church because they are not lining up with the word of God. There'd be a great shakening in that church. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, Do you never read in the scriptures the stone, the stone who is Jesus, which the builders rejected, which is the church? This became the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church, and they have rejected the word of God. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 43, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, religious people. The kingdom of God is going to be taken away from harlots, from those that have uh, uh, pretenders, those that have, um, that, uh, have a form of godliness, but they're not teaching the word of God in their church. So it will be taken away from them and given to a people producing the fruit of it and the fruit of the Spirit. In verse 44, let's see what we got here in verse 44. Okay. And he who falls on the stone, as the stone, the chief cornerstone is Jesus, will be broken to pieces. But on whomever, whomever that cornerstone falls, it will scatter him like a dust. And it just goes to say that you, you mess with God, God's going to mess with you. In verse 45, you know, there's a verse in Leviticus and Samuel says, God, if you cling to God, God will cling to you. Okay, verse uh, 45. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees, which are religious people and the leaders of the church, heard his parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. And when they sought to seize him, Jesus, 46, they feared the multitude that was hanging around Jesus. Because of that, they held him, they held him to be a prophet. So they left Jesus alone when they saw his multitude. But they were ready to seize him right then and there with Jesus' parable. The next parable we're going to cover is parable of the marriage feast that Jesus gives. Chapter 22 of Matthew, Matthew 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again. And that is those... Uh, Pharisees and Christians and religious people and Jews saying, verse 2, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. That king is God the Father, who gave a wedding feast for his son, Jesus. And that wedding feast is those that are invited are Christians that love his son, Jesus. The bride and Jesus is the groom. And verse 3, and he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited. And those are the Christians. Invited to the wedding feast. And they were unwilling to come. Christians went out to the community to invite those to the word of God. To be 
joined with Jesus the groom. In verse 4, again he sent out other slaves and telling those who had been invited, Behold, <clears throat> I, the Lord, have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted livestock are all butchered and everything is ready for this wedding feast. Verse 5, But they paid no attention and went their way. And one to his own farm, another to his own business. These people paid no attention because they're asleep. They're busy with their activities in the world. They're distracted with their iPhones or their phones and, and their farms and their jobs and with their activities in this world that they have no time to partake of Jesus, the Word of God. Verse 6. And the rest uh, seized his slaves and mistreated them and, uh, and killed them. Now, you can kill somebody with your words. According to James uh, 4.1 and 1 John 3.15, it says those who hate their neighbor is a murderer. And those who uh, hate have murder. Okay, so... But they, uh, they didn't like these slaves, these Christians that went out and shared the gospel. They, mis they were mistreated. Verse 7, But the king, God the Father, was enraged, and he sent his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and set their cities on fire. Well, let's talk about that. God the Father has armies, and that's the forces of angels, of the living beast. And, and not all the angels are good angels. Some, some of those angels are destroying angels. And you can look at Joel chapter 2, Isaiah 13, verse 4 through 6. And these are destroying angels. So he sent his armies out to destroy those murderers and set their cities on fire. And their heart is the city. And we know the city and... Um, for, uh, Corinthians 5.1, that God dwells in a city not made with human hands, but he dwells in our heart. And if you really want to look at the fire and you have time, you could always turn to Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 through 30, and it talks about the fire. Okay, verse 8, then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready. And that's where we're supposed to be. Our hearts should be ready pure and sanctified, but those who were invited were not worthy. There are many people that are called, but they're not worthy. Their heart is not worthy. Their heart is not right. There's still lawlessness and wickedness, and they don't have Jesus because they're full of idols in their heart. Verse 9. So, go therefore, to the top of the page, to the main highways. And as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. You know, in Isaiah, they talk about the highway to Mount Zion, the king's highway. And that's where we should be, the highway of holiness, the highway of purity, the highway of sanctification. And those that are really seeking Jesus are on the highway to Mount Zion, where Jesus dwells in Mount Zion. And that's in Isaiah it's in different chapters of Isaiah, several chapters about the king's highway. But they, uh, so as you find there, invite them to the wedding feast. And those slaves, Christians, went out into the streets and gathered together all that they found, both evil and good. And when you see both evil and good, that means some were lost in the world. They're worldly people. They're not religious people. And, they, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests, verse 11. But when the king came in, that's God the Father, came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw there were, there's a man not dressed in wedding clothes. And, you know, that's the wedding clothes is the garments of salvation. In Galatians 3.27, the wedding clothes is you wrap yourself with Jesus. 
And the wedding clothes is the garments of salvation. It's in Ephesians chapter 6, verse uh, 14. But the wedding clothes is wrapping yourself with Jesus. And he said to him, friend, how do you come in here without your wedding clothes? <clears throat> and he was speechless. Wedding clothes also means that the heart's pure. White linen, pure. And then verse 13, he was speechless. Then the king father said to the servant, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. And there, in that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So his heart was impure. His heart was full of darkness. He did not have a white linen heart. He did not have the garments of Jesus wrapped around him. Verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. There's going to be many people that have a form of godliness. They call themselves Christians, but their heart is wicked. Their heart is impure. They're not clean. Their heart is not clean. And therefore, they're going to be bound just like him, casted out of the wedding feast because they don't belong. But few are chosen, and few will have their heart sanctified and purified. And this is the word of the Lord. May it bless you. And remember that symbolism is not for natural wisdom, but it's written in spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. God bless you.